going to begin rather quietly because I don't want to disturb my great nephew, Roger. He's just outside, out in the woods. It rained last night and he loves the woods when they're rain drenched. There's a wooded path carpeted with lichens out there. It makes a silvery gray strip through the woods like an old fashioned holborn. Several years ago, Roger started noticing how the mosses change with the weather. In dry weather, they are thin and brittle, they crumble under your feet, but they soak up rain like a sponge and become deep and springy. He likes to run from one patch to the next, jumping up and down in that deep softness. <laughs> yeah, welcome. I'm delighted all of you have made the trip here. Not everyone is willing to travel all the way up here to my summer cottage in Maine, but I could not imagine having a summer home anywhere but right here. Forgive me if I'm seated this time. My recent arthritis has left me rather weak and my radiation treatments have left me weak. I find myself in pain most of the time. The outdoors, nature has always been my sanctuary. I bought these few acres of land about 10 years ago, in 1953. It's my treasure of a place, with tide pools down by the shoreline for exploring. From my window here, I can see out the shoreline and if you watch long enough you'll sometimes see whales and seals swim past. Oh I miss being out there with Roger. I used to wake him up early in the morning so we could go down and enjoy the early morning with the these marvelous odors of seaweed and fish on the shoreline, the tides rising and falling in rhythm, the smell of mud drying on the rocks. Sometimes I would wake him up late at night and we would take our flashlights and go down to the shoreline. If you roll up your pants and walk out to the big rocks, you could lie on your stomach. You'll see big scurrying crabs, starfish, anemones. <laughs> Roger is the son of my niece. She died. In 1957, and he was all alone. So, of course, my mother and I took him in. We've been bringing him here every summer to introduce him to the wonders of nature. The child's world is fresh and new and beautiful, full of wonder and excitement. It is our misfortune that those feelings get dimmer and even disappear before we even reach adulthood. It's important to teach them. Summer, I've been introducing him to bird watching. I said to him, You must wake up very early before the sun even rises, dress in quiet, dark clothing, nothing that rustles. Stand with your back to the rising sun so you can really see the birds. Be as still and as quiet as possible. And when a bird appears, don't take your eyes off of it. Try to notice as many details as you can. It takes practice to notice them quickly and focus on them. So don't give up. <laughs> oh, I would so much love to someday write a book about the importance of nurturing a sense of wonder in children that other adults could use with their children. But, of course, even if I had my strength, I would be indoors this summer. Not to write, but to prepare. I've been asked to address the Senate subcommittee tasked with reviewing all federal legislation pertaining to pesticides and other chemical pollutants. This is what happens when you write a firestorm of a book, Silent Spring. 
came out last fall, in the fall of 1962, and it was, as they say, an instant success. I'm still actually getting criticisms of them. A friend of mine sent me one in the mail just this morning. It says, um, if mankind were to follow the teachings of Miss Carson, we would return to the dark ages, and insects and vermin and disease would once again inherit the earth. <laughs> I shall add this one to my pile of criticism. My friend Dorothy Freeman says, not since the origin of species has a single book been so bitterly attacked by those who felt their own interests were threatened. <laughs> Nearly a hundred thousand dollars has been spent to attack the book and its hysterical author. <laughs> Is it any wonder I don't want to go home to Maryland and face the firestorm? <laughs> but it has all been worthwhile because people are waking up, things are happening. A group of people living on Long Island recently voted to cancel aerial spraying of their beautiful island for pesticides. This is good. A sense of personal responsibility is desperately needed. And now President Kennedy has asked his science advisory committee to investigate the impact pesticides and other chemical pollutants on humans and wildlife. This could mean some new legislation is coming down the road. So my task this summer is to prepare for that. I've been working on what I'm going to say, so see, see what you think. Hmm? People say these pesticides would not be for sale if they weren't safe. That simply isn't true. Trusting so-called authorities is not enough. Personal responsibility is needed. My recommendation is not the elimination of chemical pesticides altogether, but rather moderation in their use. I recommend stronger pesticide warnings, and I recommend a cabinet level agency to regulate pesticides and other chemical pollutants. And it must be an independent agency, not under the jurisdiction of chemical companies. It's all true, it's all here, but I haven't quite got it yet. <laughs> Isn't it funny where life takes you? I certainly never intended to become an expert on chemical pesticides. I never even intended to become a scientist. You know, it often surprises people to learn that I, a marine biologist, author of three books about the sea and her creatures, grew up far from the ocean. Never even saw the ocean in my own childhood. But it's true. It was not until the summer after I graduated from college that I first saw much water beyond the, the ponds and creeks near Springdale a little community just outside Pittsburgh where I grew up. But I had a mother who introduced me at an early age to the wonders of nature. She and I used to take long walks together. Together, we would learn the names of every tree and shrub that we passed. I was much younger than my older brother and sister, Robert and Marion. So my mother had time to really focus on me. She was sure that I was born for something special. She introduced me to nature and literature and music. She was the type who would not even kill an insect that wandered into our house. And only reluctantly would she cook the rabbits that Robert brought home from hunting. <laughs> I remember once I was digging in our yard and I found the most unusual rock sort of imprinted with dots and lines. So I brought it to my mother and I said to her, what is it? She said to me, let's find out together. And she took a book off a shelf. It was a fossil we discovered of a fish that had lived in this area millions of years before. Imagine 
Once upon a time, an ocean flowed all over and around Pittsburgh, covering its land with cool, dark waters before gradually, over millions of years, slowly pulling back to that far distant shore where it now sits. <laughs> I don't remember a time in my life when I didn't imagine I was going to be a writer. I don't know why. There were no writers in my family. I, I just thought it was fun to tell stories. It's funny though, it never occurred to me to become a scientist. I never even took a science class until college. And then only because all the girls at the Pennsylvania College for Women had science. A teacher was named Miss Skinker. I remember saying to her one day, Miss Skinker, I can't get the slide to focus. Oh, it's that knob. All right. Now, what am I looking for? <gasps> Wait, I see it. It's an oval, right? And it's transparent floating across. It looks like a cloud. It looks like a tiny drop of rain slowly making its way down a pane of glass. And that one tiny single-celled organism, she showed me that I could see the whole complexity of the universe captured under glass. Thanks to Miss Skinker, I abandoned writing, changed my major to biology. I Completed my master's degree in zoology at Johns Hopkins University, spent several summers at the Wood Bowl Institute. I thought I had given up writing forever. It never occurred to me I was just getting something to write about. <laughs> it would be nice to tell you that this was it. I got my degree and I became a scientist. But this was the Great Depression. Jobs were scarce. And my father never had much money. He meandered from one job to the next, never staying in any job for long. He died when I was still in my 20s. Robert and Marion both moved back in with us, Marion with two small daughters. The only person in our household to support all of us was B. So I was very fortunate to find any job. I worked with the Fisheries Bureau was not as a scientist, but it was a job. I remember one day my boss at the Fisheries Bureau came in and asked if I would help with these radio programs that they were doing about marine life. Seven minute fish tales, they were called. Except the scientists weren't having much luck with the writing and the professional writers they hired didn't have the science background needed. So would I take a stab at it? I came in one morning with the script I had written, and I said to him, I have that radio script you asked me about. I'm afraid I rather took charge of the situation. He read it over and then came back to me. He said, I don't think this will do, Miss Carson. Better try again. Because this one, Miss Carson, you should send this one to the Atlantic. It's too good for us. So I became a writer, an editor. In the daytime, I wrote pamphlets, information for the public about sea creatures and various coastal reserves. And in my free time on the evenings and weekends, I wrote articles for Reader's Digest or the Baltimore Sun. It'll be shad time soon, things like that. They brought in five, ten dollars each, and we always needed that money. My first book was about the ocean, written from the perspective of the creatures who live in and around the ocean. I will never forget nailing off this manuscript all carefully typed up by my mother. The book appeared in November of 1941, one month before the Japanese attacks on Pearl Harbor. The world received my book with superb indifference. But I was so driven to keep writing about the sea. There is something infinitely fascinating to me about water in terms of the chains of life that it supports. Start with the tiny drifting cells of green plankton. 
A water flea eats these. Fish drain them from the water. Larger mammals, mink and raccoons eat them. It is an endless cyclical transfer of material from life to life. <laughs> so I began another book. This one, I decided, would be a sort of biography of the world's oceans. Not very humble of me, I suppose. But the sea is so full of infinite mysteries. The great white shark lives there, 2,000 pound killer of the sea. And the 100 foot blue whale, largest creature known on earth. And it is also home to creatures so infinitesimally tiny that you can scoop into your two hands as many of them as there are stars in the Milky Way. One day when I was researching the sea around us, Roger and I found a starfish down at the shoreline that I brought home to study all day. And that night, I told Roger we must bring it back to the place where we had found it. Every creature needs its own habitat to survive. Every creature is a link in the vast chain of life. That book, The Sea Around Us, was on the New York Times bestseller list for 86 weeks. It was number one for 32 weeks. Many people have expressed to me their surprise that a book about science could have so many popular sales. Science as if science were the prerogative of a small group of men in white coats hidden in labs. Science belongs to everyone. The beauties and mysteries and wonders of science are the beauties and mysteries and wonders of life itself. Thanks to the sea around us, who was able to leave government work, become a full-time writer, a dream fulfilled. Of course, Spain does have a downside. I was now pestered by people everywhere I went. One day, I was at the hairdresser, my inviolate sanctuary. But as I sat there, the salon owner came marching over, snapped off the hairdryer to say an admirer was here and needed my autograph immediately. I don't know yet what I'm going to do about Roger. I haven't told him yet about the cancer. I've been so busy, there hasn't been time, and I can't seem to find the right words. It was while researching the sea around us that I first discovered a lump in my breast. It was removed. Nothing more needs to be done, the doctor said. So nothing was. I do very much wish I had not trusted him. But thanks to the sea around us, I also started receiving letters asking for help. My friend, Olga Huggins, wrote to me. She owns a small bird sanctuary. One day, she said, a plane appeared over her land, spewing clouds of this thick, swirling white fog. Dichloro, diphenyl trichloroethane, hmm? DDT, to kill the mosquitoes, which it did. It killed the mosquitoes and all the other insects and the birds. One day she came upon seven dead birds, their claws drawn up to their breasts in agony. What could she be done, she wanted to know. Who should she write to in Washington? How do we spread the word about these senseless killings? Well, I immediately began to research the new chemical pesticide like DDT. And the more I researched, the more appalled I became. In 1951, some 200 acres of salt marsh in eastern Florida were treated with dieldrin, 
What are the other new chemical pesticides? In hopes of getting rid of sandfly larva, they used one pound of dieldrin per acre. Impact on life in that salt marsh was catastrophic. Dead fish were strewn on the shoreline. Sharks moved in, attracted by the dead and dying fish. An entire crab population disappeared. And another example, fire ants, long considered little more than a minor stinging nuisance, were suddenly the target of a barrage of pesticide manufacturer propaganda. No longer a minor stinging nuisance, they were suddenly a serious threat to southern agriculture. A mighty campaign began to treat some 20 million acres in nine southern states for fire ants. Sales bonanza for pesticide manufacturers. They used dieldrin and heptachlor, both new chemicals. Few studies had been done on either one. No one really knew what the impact might be on humans and the environment. What was known was that both were many times more toxic than DDT. The result, losses running all the way up to complete destruction of wildlife. Livestock, poultry, pets, all killed. In one Texas county, a large population of armadillos and raccoons virtually disappeared. No species was spared. And when scientists later examined the bodies of dead birds, they found high concentrations of heptachlor. It's not difficult to see why. Woodcocks, which winter in Louisiana, eat earthworms, digging for them in the grounds with those long bills. Surviving earthworms in Louisiana had high concentrations of the fire ant chemicals. My friend, Dorothy Freeman, she warned me. She said to me, chemical companies will hate you. They're rich and powerful. They will do anything to turn people against you. I know, I told her, that there would be no peace for me if I kept silent. How could I ever again listen to a cardinal song in peace? But what to do and how? I was a marine biologist and a writer, not an expert in chemical pesticides. I wrote every scientist I knew, begging them to take up this cause. E.B. White would have been marvelous at capturing not only the danger, but the beauty under threat. None of them would take it on. So I came to realize I would have to write this book myself. And it would have to be a book. <laughs> Chemical companies rely too heavily on advertising from, I'm sorry, magazines rely on chemical companies for their advertising. So, to begin, you start with a blank sheet of paper, an empty page, the beginning. Words, 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 words. In nature, nothing exists alone. Now, the more I have learned about chemical pesticides, the more appalled I have become. Now, <laughs> I'm a perfectionist when it comes to writing. I agonize over each sentence, revising paragraph by painstaking paragraph. <laughs> I wonder what is in this water, besides <laughs> water. Mm. What was it that Tennyson said once? Mighty wind arises, roaring seaward, and I go.
Once upon a time, there was a little town where humans and nature lived in harmony. The town was surrounded by farms, golden fields heavy with grain, and hillsides covered with fruit trees that in spring bore sweetly scented white blossoms. In autumn, the maple and oak trees created vivid colors that blazed against the green pines. At night, you could hear foxes barking and deer rustling gently in the woods. Even in winter, those hillsides were beautiful, lined with dried weeds peeking out of snowbanks that birds would come feed upon. So many birds lived in this area. People would come from miles around just to enjoy the beautiful colors and those soft songs. Then, something evil arrived. Farmers began to whisper about strange illnesses in their families. Suddenly, chickens and sheep were becoming ill. Several children fell ill while playing and died just hours later. It was all suddenly so quiet. Where were the birds? The bird feeders were deserted. The mornings which had been filled with the songs of robins and jays and wrens, there was now suddenly no sound, just silence all across those yards and fields and woods. It was a spring without sound, a silent spring. Across this town, nestled among roof shingles and along window sills, you could still see traces of a white powder. Several weeks earlier, it had fallen like snow all across the houses, the grass, the creeks, the trees. No war had swept across this area. No witches had put a curse on new life here. The people had done it to themselves. What town am I describing? It could be any of a thousand towns in America. None of them has seen all of these tragedies, but every one of these misfortunes has happened somewhere. And many communities have seen many of them. An ominous presence has quietly appeared among us. This imaginary disaster could easily become reality for all of us. That was it. That was how Silent Spring would begin. You know, we didn't always call it that. My editor at first suggested we ought to call it at war with nature. Perhaps a bit belligerent, I said. Well, how about man against the earth or dissent in favor of man? <laughs> we tried so many titles that my literary agent, Marie Rodell, finally said we were just going to have to call it Rachel Carson's next book. But then she told me to reread that first chapter about the spring with no birds, and that was it. Silent spring. I signed a contract with Houghton Mifflin. They asked, could I deliver the manuscript in seven months? I said, yes, yes, of course. Two and a half years later, I was still researching. There was so much to learn. Here's another example. Our national symbol, the bald eagle, whose numbers have been declining at an alarm. Something is happening in the bird's environment that is affecting their reproductive capacity. What is it? No one knows. But many signs point to chemical pesticides. An ornithologist living on the western coast of Florida found and banded about a thousand young eagles between 1939 and 1949. He banded them as young birds before they even left the nest. And later, 
when he recovered the birds, he discovered they had traveled north as far as Canada before returning to the south in the winter. In his early years, he might find a hundred active nests. He might band up to 125 young eagles. But starting around 1946, the numbers of young birds began to decline. Some nests had no eggs, and, or some had eggs that had not hatched. In 1953, he searched 100 miles of coastline before finding and banding one eaglet. Other observers confirm this trend so strongly, it may be necessary for us to find a new national symbol. Over and over, we hear the same report. Occupancy of some nests by adult birds, some eggs appearing, but very few young birds, or none at all. Something is affecting the bird's reproductive capacity so extremely that there are almost no yearly additions of young birds to maintain the species. And other places have also seen shocking numbers of bird deaths. In England, huge numbers of birds died after eating seeds treated with pesticides. And not only birds died, but foxes as well. And foxes are necessary to keep down the rabbit population. It is not difficult to see why wild birds are valuable to us as members of the ecology in which we all live. Here is what I would like to know. Who has placed in one pan of the scales the leaves that might be eaten by insects? And in the other pan, these pitiful heaps of multi-hued feathers, the lifeless remains of birds that died before the unselective bludgeon of insecticidal poisons. Now, you might very well argue that I should have footnoted everything in this book, but this is a book that must persuade as well as inform. My contributions to scientific facts are not nearly as important as my ability to arouse feelings about the world of nature. But still, I do not expect you to take my word for it. In the back are 55 pages of notes. I never would have included references if I were hoping to distort or conceal or to present half truths. Took me four years to write Silent Spring difficult, painful years, struggling as my personal life collapsed. My mother died. That was catastrophic. The arthritis sometimes made my hands cramp up so much I could not hold a pen. And the cancer returned, requiring a double mastectomy. But I pushed on. The New Yorker published the first of three excerpts in June of 1962. They received more mail about the Silent Spring excerpts than they had ever received for a single article before. And that fall, the book itself appeared. And almost immediately, criticisms began to arrive. I have some of my very favorites here with me. <clears throat> Isn't it just like a woman to be scared to death of a few little bugs? This one notes that I'm a sister and says, so what is she so concerned about genetics for? Oh, this book is part of a communist conspiracy to destroy the agriculture and economy of these United States. And this one, which might actually be my favorite, no one at either County Farm Bureau office who was spoken with today had read the book, but all disapproved of it extremely. <laughs> when CBS asked me to appear on one of their television programs to talk about Silent Spring, 
three advertisers pulled their sponsorship of that show. Still, the positive reviews, the positive criticisms far outnumber the negative ones. I have learned to face both sides calmly, although sometimes I feel like a tiny transparent ghost crab, alone on a sandy beach facing the roaring surf. Island Springs sold 100,000 copies in its first four months. People must be feeling something to react that way. So now, as I prepare for this congressional address, perhaps, perhaps I ought to read from what I wrote in Silent Spring. These sprays, dusts, and aerosols are now applied almost universally to farms, gardens, forests, and homes. Non-selected chemicals that have the power to kill every insect, the good and the bad, to still the songs of birds and the leaping of fish in the streams, to coat the leaves with a deadly film and to linger on in the soil. All this, although the intended target may be only a few weeds or insects. We talk about control of nature, but man is part of nature. What we do to nature, we do to ourselves. Can anyone believe that it is possible to lay down such a barrage of poisons on the face of the earth without making it unfit for all life. They should not be called insecticides, but biocides. Question, of course, is whether to mention my own sickness, this cancer that is eating away at me. No, no, it cannot be mentioned. I wrote a great deal in Silent Spring about the impact of pesticides on cancer. I do not want anyone to say that I have a vendetta because of a personal problem. I would like to inspire feelings in those senators, but not about me, about nature. I, I truly believe it is not half so important to know as it is to feel. Once, when Roger was just an infant, I wrapped him up tightly in a blanket and I carried him down to that shoreline during a rainstorm, way out there, just at the edge of where we couldn't see. Big waves were thundering in, dimly seen white shapes that boomed and shouted and threw great handfuls of white foam at us. <laughs> Together we laughed for sheer joy. He, an infant, meeting for the first time that wild tumult of the sea. And I, with the salt of half a lifetime of sea love in me, I was rediscovering with him the wonder and excitement of the world in which we live. That is what I would like to convey to those senators, that nature not only sustains us physically, but can also give us, if we allow it, a sense of wonder so indestructible, it will last throughout life as an unfailing antidote against the boredom and disenchantment of later years. The alienation from the sources of our strengths. Oh, I would so much love to do that wonder book. That would be heaven to achieve. There is so much that I still want to do. And it is hard to accept that in all probability, I must leave most of it undone. No. No, my life has been rich. I have had rewards and satisfactions few people ever achieve. If it must end soon, I have achieved most of what I wanted to achieve. I have lived to see the publication of this book. That is good. 
good to know I will live on for people who never meet me. And mostly it's good to know I will live on with something that is good and beautiful. Now, if you'll forgive me, I probably should go lie down. This sort of thing exhausts me lately. But before I go, I'd like to leave each of you with a challenge. I would like to challenge each of you. The next time you are outdoors, the next time you are in nature, take a moment and really notice the world around you. Notice the, the ebb and the flow of the winds, the smell of the earth, the tiny folded bud waiting for spring. I find it so healing, that repetition in nature, the knowledge that spring always comes after winter. Daylight always follows night. And if a bird appears, don't take your eyes off of it. Watch it until it lands on a branch or even on the railing of your city apartment balcony. And ask yourself this. What if I had never seen this before? What if I knew I would never see this again? Those who contemplate the beauty of the world around us find reserves of strength that will endure as long as life lasts. I truly believe that the more clearly we can focus our attention on the beauties and wonders of the earth around us, the less taste we will have for its destruction. Oh, I'm coming back now. Uh, very quickly, I'm coming back as Leslie Goddard. And forgive me, my hair has been up in a wig. But I want to finish up very quickly. Uh, first of all, to, to answer a couple of questions that might have come to mind while I was talking. Uh, Rachel Carson, who was born in 1907, she published Silent Spring in 1962. She only lived 18 months. She passed away in April of 1964. She did live to see the President's Science Advisory Committee report come out. It vindicated all of the science and the arguments that she was making about these pesticides. So she did love to see that. She did not, unfortunately, live long enough to see the great flourishing of environmental activism in the late 1960s. She did not live to see the first Earth Day in April of 1970, uh, the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, the establishment of the EPA in 1970, which had been one of her great dreams, or the banning of DDT in 1972. However, the legacy that she has left behind is phenomenal. Silent Spring is still in print today. It has sold an estimated 2 million copies since 1962. Still sell, it sells at a rate of about 20,000 a year now. When you hear interviews with the founders of Earth Day, they say, you know, all of the environmental work got started in 1962 with the publication of Silent Spring. Now, there were a lot of other scientists who supported what Rachel Carson was saying, and there were certainly plenty of other environmental issues in the 60s. You might remember all the pollution. Do you remember the, when the Cuyahoga River in Cleveland caught fire because of all the pollution in it? And when um, Hootie the Owl, do you remember, give a hoot, don't pollute, all of that. But Rachel Carson is generally recognized today as the person who stirred the pot more than anyone else. Um, but her legacy, actually, I think her legacy goes well beyond what she did about chemical pesticides. It goes beyond the publication of Silent Spring. Her greatest legacy, I think, is a big paradigm shift. Because in the post-war era, the post-World War II era, there was this general belief that 
mankind can control nature. Do you remember the, um, what was it, DuPont Chemicals slogan, better living through chemistry? There was this sense that mankind is gaining control over nature. It was Rachel Carson who really stepped in and said, we are not above nature able to control it. We are part of nature. What you do to one part of nature, you do to humans as well. That viewpoint that we're inextricable, we're all in this together, is a, a mindset that's pretty widespread today. That mindset is huge and it's probably due to Rachel Carson more than anyone, as is the fact that we now use integrated pest management, which is what she advocated, monitor areas for pests, judiciously use chemical pesticides where absolutely necessary in minimum qualities, quantities, and pursue other, um, other forms of pesticides where it's possible. That's what she, what she advocated. Um, and that's why, if you remember growing up, if you grew up in the, in the 50s and 60s, you might remember seeing the trucks with DDT coming down the street. Uh, you know, sometimes the kids would be running in and out. You know, let's feel the, the DDTs swirling around us. Uh, we don't see that anymore. The issues continue. Pesticide use continues. We still have a fight between uh, major industries uh, with a lot of money at stake and uh, humans who care about the environment. What we have from Rachel Carson is the reminder that ordinary citizens, uh, grassroots people who love our planet, who love birds, who love trees, they can make a difference. And it makes a difference by falling in love with the world around you. If anyone's interested um, I, in reading and learning more about Rachel Carson, there is a wonderful DVD that was put together by PBS. Um, it is available. You can certainly buy it through Amazon um, and uh, library collections often have it. The book that I recommend most, if you're interested in a biography of Rachel Carson, there's a wonderful biography by a woman named Linda Lear called Rachel Carson, Witness for Nature. This is sort of the standard biography of Rachel Carson today. Um, and of course, if you really want to get to know Rachel Carson, Silent Spring is indispensable. Uh, the science today it was cutting edge science in 62. It's become outdated today. You really get a sense of what an incredible writer and storyteller she was. Um, and same thing with a book like The Sea Around Us, which is uh, wonderfully captures her love of nature, even though science has evolved. Um, these books still matter today. So thank you all so much for listening and uh, enjoy your time in nature. Bye-bye.